Good afternoon, everyone. This is Friday, February 5th, uh, and this is Senate Education. <clears throat> uh, this afternoon, we are uh, going to start by spending some time with a bill that Senator Rahm and others submitted. And I apologize, I just misplaced my agenda. Uh, but I believe the bill number, Jim, do you have the bill number there? 27. Thank you very much. S27. Uh, Jim took us through this bill, oh, I think it was <clears throat> last week when Senator Rahm came in. Uh, she suggested as we get going on it, uh, she's put forward a couple of witnesses, a couple of ideas. Uh, so we reached out to those individuals and we'll be hearing from them today. In addition to our work on literacy and school discipline, I, I do see us uh, starting to put together some kind of miscellaneous education bill. And I'll look to the committee uh, for the kinds of things that they would like in there. But <clears throat> this is certainly one idea. I was thinking about putting this in with uh, the, the library's bill, as well as uh, the bill that Senator Lyons uh, co-sponsored with Senator Hardy on uh, just broadly uh, women's health uh, in public schools. So those are three things that I'm thinking about putting into a miscellaneous bill, but of course I'll look to all of you as we move forward. So um, why don't we uh, get started? I'm not sure which of our two witnesses would like to begin. You're both uh, on my agenda. So I don't know if the two of you discussed who would go first. Jesse? Hello. Um, we, I, we did not discuss this, but I am happy to kick things off if that's amenable to the committee. That would be terrific. Great. Thanks for being with us. If you'll just introduce yourself for the record, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and uh, give us your thoughts on S27. Great. Um, well, thank you, Senator Campion, and to the full committee for having me. Also, I need to say that um, Jeannie, I think, maybe that's how you pronounce your name, is lovely to work with and coordinate with. So you have a really wonderful uh, staff liaison. Um, my name is Jesse Baker. I am the city manager in Winooski. Um, I have served in this role for four years and I'm speaking today on behalf of myself as well as Mayor Lott, um, who unfortunately had a professional conflict today in her regular job. Um, so thank you for having me. And I am I do have, um, I'm sorry, I was not able to send it to you in advance, but I do have a few comments to make first, and then I'm happy to answer any questions if that's amenable. That's fine. And just a reminder for committee members, now that I do have my agenda in front of me, this is uh, facilitating cultural liaisons uh, in schools and in municipalities and looking at that possible partnership. <clears throat> Um, so again, thank you for being invited to provide testimony today. Um, S27 as introduced, would, as introduced would support um, Winooski's community-wide efforts to provide educational and municipal services in culturally appropriate ways. It would allow us to expand the ways in which we provide services to all community members and make sure all of our community members had access to the services provided as well as a voice at all decision-making tables. Um, and hopefully um, a seat at those tables as well. Um, of course, I am biased, but Winooski, I think is a very special place. Um, as you likely know, we are the only majority and minority school district in the state. Uh, we are also a single municipality school district, um, which is not unique, but um, is, a uni is an advantage to us. 18% um, of our residents were born in another country. Um, which we use as a placeholder for um, limited English proficiency or English is not a first language. Our community has been a welcoming community for decades, um, open to new neighbors, and we really see our diversity as among our biggest strategic advantages. Under this legislation, if passed, our ability to partner with our school district and jointly fund our community liaison roles um, would be a huge benefit. This idea first emerged in our community in 2018 at an equity summit we held with formal and informal leaders from across the city, the school, and other community partners. Um, expanding those roles and having dollars beyond just educational fund dollars to support this work would allow us to maximize the resources we have to best serve our community 
it would allow us to provide those services in the most efficient way possible. So through you know, the individual community liaisons rather than multiple roles and multiple partners. It would create livable wage jobs for the individuals doing this work now within the school district. And it would allow us to expand those jobs to full-time year round jobs, which of course these roles in our communities are so critical and really don't follow just the school um, calendar. I also, um, just in wrapping up, I also wanted to note that while this has been a priority of ours for several years, it has become more and more apparent through COVID-19. Um, you know, when you think about whose role is it to get out accurate information about COVID precautions or to inform neighbors about vaccination opportunities or com to communicate the importance of isolation and quarantine if tested positive, it's really all of our roles. It's the state government, obviously, it's municipalities, it's school districts. A similar thing can be said about things like affordable housing access, unemployment, childcare, and public safety support. Clearly all of those factors impact how children show up to school and need to be communicated to all of our residents. However, they are also clearly critical to the healthy functioning of a municipality and a community. So we would like the opportunity to help fund that and help coordinate um, those efforts so they go beyond just the walls of the school and can reach out to the community as a whole. Um, being able to share those resources and contribute to funding those resources only makes sense and will only strengthen our community. So those are what I wanted to share and I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have. So I'm just wondering, just to kick it off, what, so right now what is happening in, and Jesse, you're uh, with, um, you're with the schools or you're with the uh, town? City manager. The city manager. I'm the city manager. So I'm the, the municipal um, equivalent to the school superintendent. Okay. So what's happening right now without this in place? What sorts of things, how are things getting done? So it's a great question. So right now our community liaisons in our school district um, help communicate between the educational needs of our, res of our children and their families. Um, and often, to be honest, that spills over into city, city um, messaging as well. However, when we as the city want to get word out to all of our community about a new service offered or a policy we're considering and invite those voices to the table, we are either funding those professionals in hours above what they are already working, or we're hiring different professionals and different translators who don't have the relationships with the families, um, or honestly, we're just not doing it and we're not effectively reaching our neighbors. Um, so this would allow us to again, identify those full-time staff, have them build relationships in the community, and then send messages both on the education front and on the municipal front. Oh, cool. Uh, questions, other questions, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you, Jesse. Uh, I can see the need for this, certainly in the schools and within the community. So, um, and you've mentioned that during the pandemic, the need for it has been magnified. Um, can you give some examples of where you've entered into some kind of a liaison with um, certain communities during the either during the pandemic or at times where you as the community as a city have paid for these services? Sure. Um, let me tell you about two different examples, if I may. Um, one, so as you likely know, we Winooski had the first community spread outbreak of COVID over the summer. Um, and as part of that outbreak, and then again, uh, more recently in the winter, we stood up um, morning huddles with VDH to make sure for the Vermont Department of Health to make sure first thing in the morning, we were all on the same page about um, testing, um, access to transportation, access to you know, food support services so folks could maintain quarantine. Um, during the school was a part of, the, of that partnership and sat at that table because obviously they are significant community leaders as well. Um, and through that effort, the community liaisons were able to um, work with families that they knew to be in isolation and quarantine and ensure that they had the best access to services. Um, at that point, we felt like that was an appropriate use of school funds to do that because again, it was that ability for children to stay engaged in school and stay, um, stay participating in that virtual learning environment. Having said that, it is a question about whether that is a municipal expense or a school expense. Um, 
Second example I'd like to offer is that we are, um, as part of these conversations at the city level uh, to improve how we are inclusive in our community, um, we were recently successful at uh, um, receiving a Working Communities Challenge Grant through the Boston Fed. Um, and as part of that process, we wanted to identify ways we as the city could be more equitable in how we provide services. Um, through that process, we actually contracted, we the city, entered into individual contracts with the community liaisons, happened to be the community liaisons because they are the ones that had the relationship in the community and had them partner with us to do some of that initial planning work and bring their expertise to the fore. But what that resulted in was those individuals having full-time jobs where they were providing services at the education level and then additionally doing this work for the city. And if we had the opportunity to partner on that work, then together we could build reasonable work plans that were supported by um, a living wage and equitable hours and whatnot, rather than you know going back to the same people time after time. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, Senator Hooker. I'm wondering. So, uh, in the city of Rutland, in this, oh, I'm sorry, Senator Lyons, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's good to see you here today, Jesse, um, and thanks for all the great work that you're doing. Uh, it, you know, it's really evident. I, I don't think people fully understand the um, integrated network between school and, and city. It is, it is really amazing. When you look at the newsletter that the school puts out, it's really a community newsletter. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so... I have a difficult time when I'm reading it, pulling, up, pulling things apart, uh, apart, whether or not it's the city of Winooski or the school district. And it's a good thing. So um, the other one thing I will ask you is, have you talked with the Department of Health at all about any resources that are coming as a result of the federal funding passed in December? and the availability, there's going to be huge availability for the Department of Health to do translations, uh, information and working with uh, minority populations. And I'm just wondering if it seems to me that this would be a perfect opportunity for your community liaison to work uh, with those folks and put some things together. But that, that's probably a step ahead of where you are right now, but. Um. Thank you, Senator Lyons, and nice to see you as well. Um, so we have worked with our with the Vermont Department of Health. We still have these um, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday huddles with them to ensure that our community, both Burlington and Winooski, um, are being equitably served by um, the services coming out of VDH. And they, I will say they have been amazing partners. Um, also at that table are the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, uh, USCRI, Community, um, Committee on Refugees and Immigrants, and um, UVMMC. Um, they, so yes, VDH has absolutely, and our community liaisons are on those calls as well to ensure that they're getting the same messaging and able to push out through their networks the same information. Um, they, VDH has been an incredible support in ensuring that our community's needs are met, and certainly we will continue to work with them on any new funding they get really to ensure, honestly, that that funding is done by the communities, not just to the communities, but the members of my community who are, um, who in, for, for whom English is a second language, are using their cultural expertise to be those health, public health promoters, um, not just, you know, people who look like me going to them with messaging. Thank you. Senator Hooker and Senator Terenzini, I'm wondering, would this, is there a need for this in Rutland given, you know, first of all, you know, this can be used anywhere. I'm just trying to, I'm wondering what the rest of the state looks like in terms of needs. Well, I, I'll try to address some of that. You, as you know, um, <clears throat> four years ago, we ha had an, off of, an opportunity to have 25 uh, refugee families settle in, in Rutland. We ended up with three families. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that the opportunity is reopened. So many things have happened since then where um, the borders were closed um, both at the city and in the country. Uh, and I'm hoping that that's going to be uh, 
there's going to be a change there. But I have to say that this type of um, liaison would have been wonderful for the families that moved here. We did have help from the refugee resettlement for a while, but that their funding was limited. Uh, and so the families were essentially on their own. And I have to give credit to the very devoted group of volunteers who stepped in, including one family that became surrogate grandparents and uh, have made sure that the kids have gotten to school, mm -hmm. that they get to their doctor's appointments, that the parents have been able to engage in English language classes. Um, one of the families has was a, you know, well, they've all moved into different houses, which is good. You know, they started out in small apartments that one of our local landlords provided um, at a very, very reasonable rate and then moved to more um, suitable apartments and then finally to houses. Um, two of them have their own. But I think that this type of liaison would have been invaluable for them. Great. Certainly not many of us in Rutland spoke Syrian or Turkish or whatever they were speaking when they came. Thankfully, we did have a few people who had been here uh, for a while, for quite some time, who were from Syria, and they were able to step in as well. But I have to give a lot of credit to people who have been tutors and friends and helpers and movers over the past four years. Senator Terenzini, anything to add there? Well, um, you know, I, I had put my hand up before you posed the question to me, oh, Senator okay. Campion, but it, it, if you don't mind, I'll ask Please. now. Uh, you know, I, I read the bill, I have it here in my hand, and to me, it's, it's, it's almost surprising that this has to come before hmm. the legislature. Um, you know, I've served on uh, school board and select board and so on. And, and to me, it's almost like, you know, if you identify a need in your school district or community, um, you, you go out and take care of that need. I mean, if you look at a school, if, if you need to hire a, a, another custodian or a, another bus driver or at a school nurse, to me, it's you, you do what you have to do to run the school or the business. And to me, if a, if a community needed this position, which obviously not all Vermont communities or school districts would need a liaison, but obviously some do, I, it just, to me, I'm, I guess it, it's a little bit baffling that it's even here in our committee as to why, you know, the law or the school district just doesn't hire what they need to operate the business. Good question. Uh, Jim, uh, I don't know. That wasn't answer? a question. I guess it was just a statement. Yeah, right. But I think it's, it's an important one. And I think it's, it's, it's a good reminder for all of us just to pause and ask Jim, Jim, this is, you know, Tell us again, what is this, this is allowing to happen? That well, um, so the statute that it's amending uh, requires separation of municipal funding from education funding, okay? So it's unclear to me when you have a jointly funded position uh, from municipal money and education money, how that fits into the, the separation that we have in statute. So this is saying that notwithstanding that separation of statute, school districts, districts can do this. They can jointly fund this position. The same would be true for SROs. Uh, we have a statute on SROs now, but it's not really an enabling language. Um, so really SROs should fall into the same category of having an exception to this uh, division because that's jointly funded too. Uh, so, kind of, and that's not done so far in statute. I think it should be done, but uh, this is making it clear that notwithstanding separation, this position can be jointly funded by by school districts and, and municipalities. So, right now, SROs, school resource officers, are a combination of funds, municipal funds, and school funds generally. Yes, but there's no permissive language in statute uh, like we're doing here. So yeah. it's unclear to me whether how that fits if challenged in court. So this would prevent, I think, yeah. having that kind of challenge for this position. Yeah. Senator Perslick. Thank you. Uh, Jim, on that point, 
And I think I asked this question before when we first went through the bill, and I can't remember the answer, sorry. And that is with the excess spending limitation. So this just allows them to joint fund it, but does it define it whether it is an education expense or a municipal expense as far as things like the excess spending limit that a, municipal, a school district? This bill here does not go into uh, excess spending. So you could go further and say that the cost uh, to the school district of uh, funding this cultural liaison position is not counted for excess spending. You could do that, but that's not what this bill does now. Yeah, I think that would be a good thing to add. Any other questions? Uh, Senator Chittenden. So, so on this point, and maybe it's not a time to discuss when we have witnesses here, but one question I'm going to have for you, Jim, is, is there uh, in the language or is it Precedent is there precedent for uh, having uh, qualifying conditions meet for when this can take it, uh, take effect, and does that then make it easier to um, uh, abide by the current statutory language? For example, if we have a town that is the town with the uh, with documentable large number of um, um, communities that need additional services like these, that that would trigger the ability to do this, and then it wouldn't allow for blurring of town and school funding in other cases. No, the case to be made substantively for having the position doesn't go to um, the issue of separation of funding. So, so you have a statute that says funding should be separated, but it doesn't define municipal services, doesn't define education spending. So you really don't know what, the, don't know, know what it means. So this approach here that I've taken in terms of statute is to be careful that we don't violate that separation. Any other questions? And then Senator Persick, we can certainly consider your, your, your point once we uh, do markup, but I think it's, you know, it's an interesting one. Senator Persick, do you have any other final, anything you wanna say before we note, move to the next witness? I know you're a co-sponsor of the bill. Yeah, no, well, I think I, what I said last time we took it up is that I was just, when we did the tour, the education committee did a tour last year of Winooski School. And we met, the first thing we did was sit in a room with I think five or four of the cultural liaisons and they each explained what they did. And it was very eye-opening and impressive. And so based on that experience, if there's other towns or even Winooski, just so they can do more of it, yeah. I want it to be as supportive as possible. Great, thank you, uh, terrific. Um, Jesse, thank you. Aaron uh, McGuire, Ms. McGuire, you are with the Vermont Council on Spe Special Education Administrators, and you're here to also testify on this. And we've I seen am. you before. You have seen me before. Thank you for having me. I actually would like to amend the title I'm using to testify here today a little oh. bit and articulate that I'm here uh, as the Director of Equity and Inclusion for the Essex Westford School District. So representing sort of another school district in the state while next door to Winooski um, to speak to this need. Um, I also serve as Co-Director of Student Support Services. And interestingly, as I've been listening to the testimony, it feels relevant to maybe touch the importance of how we use funds and how when we have significant separation of funds and what they can and cannot be used for, it actually has significant impact on practice and how we engage with people as we implement services. That's true in special education where there's been some requests to look at some more flexibility of how we use those funds to be able to serve more students as opposed to being really rigid based on how we spend those funds. I also, for this committee's information, serve as the president of the Council of Administrators of Special Education at the national level, and so do hold a, an, an amount of expertise related to special education that doesn't apply as much here as for your information, um, but really come to you today as a school district that is working very hard on a nine-component equity plan that incorporates really significantly um, community and school district engagement around issues of 
equity, making sure that we are collaborative in our community toward these efforts. And it feels important to share that in order to address the issues um, for many populations, including refugees and immigrants and people who are multilinguistic um, in their diversity status, that we have what we need to support them not only in our schools, but also in our community. Um, Essex has embarked on a recent project to bring um, some of the equity work into our community. And so we've been meeting really regularly with our municipality and we are lifting up a, an equity committee that is designed of both the school district and the municipality and the ability to do work together toward these efforts is enhanced by a bill like this to make sure that, for example, um, you know, if we were to say, well, we need this and you need this and we'll fund this and you'll fund this, with this kind of statute, it makes it so that that person can only do this with these hours and only do that with those hours. And what we know is people and children are whole. They're not sometimes school and sometimes community. It's a whole student, a whole family. And our cultural liaisons are critical components of our support structure in our school district. They are not currently employed by our municipality, but as we have moved into equity work in a, in a collaborative way to make sure that we're focusing on a sense of inclusion and belonging in our community as well as in our school district, there have been circumstances where I've reached into our translators and cultural liaisons to say, can you go do some part-time work for the municipality to translate this or to support this focus group or to try to gather feedback from members of the community who speak a different language or speak multiple languages so that we can make sure to have their voices at the table. Um, and where we have funding structures that limit our collaboration between schools and communities, it makes me wonder about about what exactly that is for. Um, and why is it that we would want that given that we talk consistently about the importance of the collaboration between schools and our communities and really desiring collaborative leadership going forward. Um, so I do think that, you know, making sure that we are able to be collective and not just collaborative in our impact by co-funding positions in ways that describe what the position will do, but not limiting when that happens or which timesheet gets submitted or who pays what, that we're able to be supportive of people. I think to Jesse's point, having people be full-time, increasing the number of people that we have available to do this very, very critical work that has impact for families, both as it relates to their community access and their school district makes very good sense for me. Um, I can, I do wonder uh, what other opportunities might exist in this space. So I know we're in a very sort of limited scope as we have a conversation about S27 on this topic. And it just, it makes me wonder, and I've been wondering this as I've been a partner with the Essex municipality, uh, both Essex Junction and, and Essex Town in thinking forward together, what might be possible if this limitation didn't exist? And, you know, sometimes structures do create limitation that don't necessarily help us forward. And so I do think this is one that is worth looking at, worth considering. I understand the importance of being clear about how we're spending tax dollars. Of course, that's important. It's important that we're able to be articulate about that. It's important that we are able to be held accountable to those issues. But assuming accountability has to mean separation, I think is an important question for us to be asking about this particular topic. I think um, without reiterating everything Jesse said, I'll just say that I completely agree from the school district perspective in another community um, that, that this has a uh, real benefit. And it is interesting to me that we've already been doing this within the context of SROs and yet it requires um, action from the legislature for cultural liaisons. I, I just sort of came upon that as I was listening to this conversation. And that's an interesting observation, I think, to be made. So um, with that, uh, happy to offer any uh, answers to questions that you may have. Uh, good testimony. Any, any questions? Uh, Senator Lyons, please. Um, I don't actually have 
questions, I just wanted to say thank you to Aaron. Um, we uh, in our county, I think Senator Chitton and I both know how really effective you have been. Um, the, the combination of Winooski and Essex being here today is super. It's really amazing. Thank you both. And Aaron, uh, it's outstanding what you're doing. It's terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyons. I appreciate that. Terrific. Senator Hooker, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Erin. Uh, I'm curious to know, Jesse, you mentioned making these positions full time. Who would they be working for? Um, you know, it, does that have to be a decision that's made up front? I mean, where does their, I, I know that the, the funding would be mixed, but who would they be um, responsible to or who would their authority be? Senator Herker, I hear that question maybe for Jesse. Jesse, do you want to go ahead and respond? Well, either of you. I'm, yeah, I, I think Jesse answer. is better situated to respond because when Newski has ventured forward further than Essex into this opportunity, and I am really looking forward to exploring it more uh, as I, I learn more about what they're doing. So hearing that from Jesse would be helpful for me too. Sure, thank you. Um, my perspective on that is that it would be up to the community to decide who held primary authority and then document as we do with us using the SRO example, document through a memorandum of understanding or a shared services agreement that's executed between both elected bodies, school board and city council, um, how that cost would be split. So for example, using the SRO model, um, the SRO is a, Winous a sworn Winooski police officer who is assigned to the school district during school hours. He is our employee, he carries our certification, and per our executed agreement between the city council and the school committee, um, we have an understanding of how that cost is shared. In this example, I would imagine it would work in reverse in Winooski because that expertise started at the school um, and that the need for ensuring that parents and children and teachers are connected is primary you know, ensuring that that, um, that um, information is shared, that there, those services are as, uh, um, as accessed as appropriately as possible would be the primary expertise. And then they would contract back with the city. I would agree with that too, Jesse. I think that um, because our cultural liaisons are um, situated presently in our school district, that that would likely be the case. And I don't at this point see the readiness for our, our municipal partner to be uh, hiring the majority of the position necessarily at this point, but more um, uh, uh, an extension of the role out into the community from the district where that design was created to begin with. Yeah. Okay. And so my understanding is that this bill would just enable communities to do this and you'd have to go to the voters in order to get their consent to mix these funds and hire these positions? Or would it just be part of the approved budget? I understood that it would be part of the approved budget. So for example, when I present my budget around equity and um, support for English language learners that we are thinking about this as part of our budget and then expressing the intent to create a memorandum of understanding, for example, for the remainder of the position with the municipality and, and that they would be having that same conversation. I think for me, the, the uh, real impetus here is to make sure that we're not controlling what people can do with their hours at any given time. And it's truly a collaborative effort, right? I mean, we can hire someone in the school district and then they can go and work for the municipality for the rest of their day. There, you know, there's nothing that stops some of those like designs now. It's just that this kind of statute limits what you can do in a truly collaborative way with a whole person and a whole position around a whole family, recognizing that you're meeting both needs at one time and suddenly have this need to kind of bifurcate your work in some way because it's school and then community. Senator Terenzi. I was just gonna say that how um, Ms. Baker described the MOU between the school district and the municipality for an SRO program, that's exactly how we did it in my local municipality uh, and it makes a lot of sense how it works. It's clean, it's, it's uh, transparent, you know where the funding's coming from 
And it seems like that would work in a position like this, in my opinion, if it, if it was legal and I would defer to Jim, of course, for that, but. Perfect. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Senator Lyons, please. Yeah, a, a question came to mind uh, for each of you, and that is, uh, as as you have the liaison, the, the work going on, uh, is it possible, or have you documented some of the benefits to the community? So uh, over time, it would seem to me it would save, you know money let's you know that's always the bottom line but also save some of the social concerns um the the substance use issues that we see in our communities and uh and then the acceleration of some of these folks into uh educational work that they might not otherwise have uh been able to get get to or gain so is do you do you keep any outcomes-based uh, records, or do you have any evidence for how effective this has been? And I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I speculate that there's a lot of good data out there, but I don't, and I don't know how you capture it given the type of position. Uh, thank you, Senator Lyons, for that question. Um, it's a great question. I think that. Um, so first of all, I should say that um, I would encourage you to reach out to our superintendent or our director of ELL services in Winooski. I'm sure they track data on the time that the liaisons work on different things. And I'm sure they have more specific examples for you. Um, I think from the city side perspective or my perspective, um, one, it is, I, I think these positions do save money ultimately in other state services not needed to be accessed because people are receiving the right level of service at the right time. I also think quite frankly, it elevates people's engagement with their own lives and their engagement with their own capacity and long-term um, contributions to the community. Um, so I think it's as much about saving money as it is about increasing um, community involvement and fulfilling of one's own, um, own destiny. I think for, on a data side, what I can share is that, um, and this isn't a direct correlation, but I think it is a contributing factor for both of our COVID outbreaks, our COVID outbreak in May and June and our COVID outbreak in December and January. Um, our numbers in our LEP communities, our limited English proficiency communities spiked and we brought in the community partners, the people who had relationships in community and were being paid to do these these jobs and you see a precipitous decline. So you see that when you insert the service in a language that is accessible to folks, things improve very quickly. Um, so that's the one kind of data point I will share. Well, and yeah, that's, that's, that's amazing actually. Uh, and then um, it would be interesting to look at any um, police related issues, uh, you know, reduce, reduced, uh, engagement with uh, public safety, law enforcement in a negative way. But yeah, thank you. Great, anything else? Any other comments or questions? Okay, not seeing anything. Uh, Ms. Baker, Ms. McGuire, thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. It's an important topic uh, and certainly sounds like it, it can, uh, this bill could be a real asset to, to your communities without a doubt. So um, if we have any additional questions uh, or if we make any adjustments, please, if you be willing just to continue to track our work. Um, and we also know that the two of you are, are there and ready to work with us, which, which is great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank nice you. All of you. Bye. Terrific. Committee, we are now moving, uh, as we know, uh, our educational landscape in Vermont uh, has public schools, uh, home schools, our academies, independent schools. So we've, we've not heard uh, anything yet uh, from Mill Moore. Mr. Moore, it's great to see you. Thank you for inviting us in, Senator. Well, I appreciate uh, you uh, uh, 
being in touch and you are all certainly play an important role in the lives of the education of many Vermonters. And so we're, we're grateful for you to come in and, and just give us starting with an overview of your work, um, the kinds of things we might partner with you on and, and also where you're seeing things as it relates to COVID right now in our independent institutions. And the other thing I know that we're going to be hearing afterward, uh, and uh, Drew, how do I pronounce your last name? Um, you're muted, Drew. We still can't hear you, Drew. Um, it's pronounced Gradinger. Gradinger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gradinger is here with Mr. Moore and will be adding, uh, possibly adding testimony if we, if we end up hearing from him. Can you uh, hear me now? Now we can, yes. Correct. Yeah, thank you. And we're, Mr. Gradinger is specifically going to respond to S16, uh, the school discipline bill, uh, for lack of a better uh, title at this point, um, after Mr. Desmarais takes us through our new version. But first, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Senator. Good afternoon, senators on the committee. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come in and introduce ourselves. Uh, the Vermont Independent Schools Association is the advocacy group analogous to the other educational stakeholder groups that represents the independent schools community, which overall uh, educates about one in every 10 students in grades K through 12 in Vermont. I've got a two, two slides that I'd like to show you by way of giving you an overview. Uh, this is always an adventure when you try to share screens, so here goes. says the host has disabled my screen sharing. Jeannie's in a bad mood today. I think she's yeah. just not going to. <laughs> Jeannie's never in a bad mood, actually. <laughs> oh, that's not true. But I was busy doing something else. I'm sorry. Just give me a minute. No need to apologize. So, Mr. Moore, you are now co-host. You can share your document. Let me know if you need help. All right. All right. Uh, let's see here. I've got too much on my screen now. Let me see if I can figure out what's going on. Okay. I hope folks can see that at the top of the screen, it says Vermont Independent Schools, 126 schools, 8,100 students. Uh, that's the, the summary, but I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way up. So across the bottom row, there are uh, three dozen general purpose schools uh, that enroll uh, about half of the total, around 4,800 students. Another, what I term special purpose schools, most of them are the winter sports academies uh, with around 500 students. Then there's a cluster of the religious schools, which I know have been much on your minds lately. Uh, a dozen of the Roman Catholic schools, another seven other schools affiliated with other denominations. They total out to 19 schools on the next row with a couple thousand students. So we're uh, moving up to that next row, uh, beginning to summarize, we've got the approved religious schools. These are schools with state approval. Uh, approved general education schools total, that's the special purpose schools plus the general purpose schools. Uh, and these are all schools that meet the approval requirements established by the State Board of Education. Then off on the left side uh, is that orange box. And this is the one that Drew will be able to speak to better than I because he leads a, a therapeutic special education school. Uh, there's 31 of those with about 800 students. These are students whose disabilities are so serious that they uh, are no longer able to be served adequately in their original home school location. So they are now being served in a school that is operated uh, with uh, facilities and programs expressly designed to meet those serious disabilities. Uh, to the next level up, there are recognized schools versus approved schools. If a school chooses not to meet the standards of imposed by the State Board of Education, then it is classified as a recognized school. Every school in Vermont has to be either recognized or approved. 
to be recognized, the school has to report once a year uh, to the state board, uh, to the state agency of education rather, and report its enrollment so that students will not be held truant uh, if they're not uh, on the record someplace as actually attending school. So overall, looking at this picture, what you see is something that's very different from the public schools community. You see a much wider diversity of educational philosophies. You see a much wider diversity of missions and purposes. <coughs> Uh, and you see the divergence between the approved and the recognized schools. So I, I, when I'm speaking about the independent schools community generally, uh, there's a lot going on. And uh, I encourage you uh, to avoid uh, adopting assumptions based on your uh, experience with the public schools uh, when you're approaching the independent schools community because it operates rather differently. And the most fundamental difference is that all of the attendance at these schools is voluntary. Everybody in an independent school has chosen to be there. And that really affects a lot of the management and operation of the schools from the, uh, the management side and also the attitude of those who are in the schools because they have chosen to be there. They are not there involuntarily. They are there because they've made that distinct choice that that is the position, the location best for them. Now I'm going to see if I can remember how to unshare uh, and go back to where I belong. There we are. That is the basic overview. Um, schools are scattered all over the state. Uh, as you might expect, there are more in the population centers, such as Burlington or Rutland and St. Johnsbury, but you're going to find independent schools in some pretty out of the way places. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, it's a community that's diverse and it's geographically well dispersed around Vermont. So that, Mr. Chairman, is, is the, the brief overview. Uh, shall I go on now and talk about uh, S61? Um, do you mean S16? S16, excuse okay, me. No, I just wanted to make sure. Um, any questions on independent schools? Uh, yes, please, Senator Chittenden. I, I was listening, I, uh, but could you give me a better idea, maybe with not example names, but example reasons? Uh, why would a school choose to be only recognized and not approved? What are those? The, what are the the driving distinction between not going through that approval process? Uh, could be cost. It could be uh, a desire to uh, avoid government oversight. Uh, there are some religious schools that, that certainly feel that way. They want to keep the government uh, at some distance from their, uh, from their school and from their philosophy. Uh, those are the two principal reasons. The, the reason, principal reason for wanting to be involved are two, or wanting to be approved are two. One is uh, it's an indication to families that are choosing that school that the school has met some standards. And second, it makes the schools eligible to receive public funds from uh, tuitioning districts if they're near a district. Of course, in some parts of the state, there are no nearby tuitioning districts, whereas in other parts of the state, there are quite a few. Uh, my follow up and not necessarily a question, but I, I would love guidance from either uh, Jim or the chair where I could better understand what that what questions and what how rigorous that approval process is and what kind of questions and certifications are occur when, when a school is approved, but maybe it's, that's for another day. It is all written into statute. It's in 16 BSA 166B. And we can get that for you, Senator Chitton, and that's something that uh, Mr. Demaray, uh, if Jim's willing in the next uh, few days. If not, I'm happy to also pull that up. Uh, Mr. Moore, one question I had. So is it safe to say though, all of our schools um, approved, whatever their, their sort of status, independence, everybody's faculty are all getting FBI background checks, everybody, you know, health checks in terms of, of what, you know, is, you know, the, what the kitchen is looking like, that kind of general stuff. Yes. Not, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And where do our, our academies fall in this? I'm sorry if I missed that. Well, that's just an informal term of art. Senator Campion, uh, they're all independent schools, mm -hmm. so, but the term uh, town academies is often 
used. Uh, and that refers to schools that uh, in a particular location have made a commitment to do all the things that a public school would do in addition to whatever other mission they feel is important. Uh, an example of that would be Burn Burton Academy in Bennington County or St. Johnsbury Academy or Thetford Academy. Uh, we have both elementary schools and high schools uh, that fulfill that. And, and by the, the chief things that they have to do to, uh, to qualify in that role is have an open admissions program, it usually applies to their home district um, and meet state approval standards, of course, uh, provide special education. Senator Hooker. Just a quick question on whether or not recognized schools are able to um, take public funds for tuition. No, they are not. Is there a difference between recognized um, and approved schools and their abilities to take public funds? Yeah, yeah, that's substantial. Recognized schools are not eligible for public funds. They're not. Just, just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. That's a good question. Senator Chin. Yeah, so to Senator Campion, you asked about the uh, the health and safety, the inspections, like the food and kitchens, those do apply, those those certifications or those processes are happening with the unrecognized schools? Is that what I heard you say? No, those do not apply to recognized schools. They apply to approved schools. Oh, thank you for that clarification, Senator Chinden. I was under the impression that everybody at least had, no matter what school, FBI background check, health inspection, and that's not the case. That's we, not the case. Somebody could open a very small school, not want it approved. The children go to that school every day, and some of those kinds of those those things are not required. That was established by a Supreme Court opinion back in 1923. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moore. Good to see you. And we are going to move into S-16. We uh, worked on S-16, uh, was it just a couple of days ago? Yes, yeah, Senator Lyons, please. I didn't know if um, Drew Gradinger was gonna be talking about um, the specific category of school. Yes, I was asked to, to come and speak specifically about therapeutic schools. Oh, terrific. Thank you. I did not know that. Why don't we do that first okay. before we move into S16? All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I know it's Friday afternoon. Uh, last time I testified, I, I think I almost passed out cookies and coffee because I know it gets, it gets long. So I appreciate you being here uh, and representing our great state and allowing us to speak. So I'm Drew Gradinger. I'm the head of school for Kindle Farm. Uh, and we're a division of Wyndham and Windsor County's uh, designated agency, HCRS. Um, there are roughly 30 uh, therapeutic schools in Vermont, and about half of them are Vermont Care Partners designated agency schools, and the other half are approved independent schools. Uh, together, uh, we serve about 800 students, and these are the kids that need our help the most. These are the kids whose districts have spent a great deal of time and money uh, in the IEP process, trying to support their kids in-house as they should, least restrictive environment. Uh, and after a great deal of effort have determined that that's not working for the student. And then we are, uh, our therapeutic schools are an option for these IEP and 504 students. Uh, so what a privilege it is to, to go above and beyond for these most needy kids. It's, it's been my mission. I've been here 25 years um, and what a privilege. And I, I did a little research, you know, almost all of you have uh, some of these schools in your county. In Washington County, you have Maple Hill, Choice Academy, uh, in Rutland, you have Howard Center's Faye Honey Knopp. In Chittenden, you have the Baird Center, Gene Garvin, and Center Point. So you probably know us uh, one way or another. Uh, today, I was able to listen uh, to the Secretary of Education, and I don't think anyone needs a, a lesson uh, that COVID is wreaking havoc on our kids. Uh, a large majority of our kids are not in 
school full time. Some are not in school at all. Uh, the vast majority of therapeutic schools uh, are in person, uh, working five days a week uh, because our kids need it. Our ratios are high. We have high staff to student ratio uh, and we're nimble and flexible. And this is kind of what we do. Uh, and that's because our students are at the most risk of, of this pandemic. They have established disabilities, mental health history, acute developmental and educational needs. And then you compound this with the fact that at least at Kindle Farm, 78% of our kids are on free and reduced lunch. And I think that's likely true for the vast majority of, of, of our schools, which make food security an issue, internet access uh, an issue, and parents challenged with uh, paying phone bills, having internet, uh, driving kids where they need to go. At Kindle Farm, which I believe you know, represents many of us, in-person learning is the priority uh, to, to get these guys both emotionally, behaviorally, and academically uh, going through this pandemic. And we're able to deliver on this mission pretty fun. Our ratios, at least at Kindle Farm, are one adult for three kids, and classroom density uh, during COVID is an obvious hurdle. Uh, so this pandemic has really challenged us all. Transportation for most of our schools are on these seven person minivans, uh, which used to be able to have five or so kids. Now we're talking a max of two kids. Wearing PPE, uh, we thought would be horrible on kids. Uh, they were so excited to come back uh, that, that wearing masks was not a giant issue, but it does get in the way for kids with sensory issues, kids ability to read facial expression, and a lot of things they uh, typically um, used to ameliorate some developmental disabilities and things like that. Um, we also see kids during the pandemic weaponizing the masks, bodily fluids, uh, and things like that, uh, because we're all, we're all afraid of, of getting COVID. Uh, and for Kindle Farm, in order to bring all our students in, uh, we had to create an entirely new program starting in July and, and be ready in September. Uh, Three-fifths of our ki kids are off campus, either in our farm, in the community, or we have one day distance learning so that they can practice those skills in the case that we had to go virtual. That's been going really well. But let me be really clear. Uh, our staff are mission driven in all these schools and we're excited to serve our students in person um, because and they're often resistant to school, but most of our students are pretty eager to get back after six months. I think sometimes you don't know what you've got till it's gone. Uh, as an administrator, uh, we're really dealing with COVID fears, uh, both for kids, families, and staff. Uh, you know, we serve 15 districts in seven counties and two states. So we're really uh, got a, a wide geographic swath coming into the school. Uh, and so uh, if that were to have an outbreak, that would go out to a, a, wide, a wide distribution. And, and that's a little scary. Uh, and our therapeutic role necessitates close proximity uh, because we have to be aware of students. Uh, these kids are often sent to us because they're not safe in their environment. And so we have to be close to, to ensure safety. Uh, and then also for reading, writing, because that's often difficult for our kids in occupational therapy type schools. And despite this, our therapeutic schools are not labeled 1A in the vaccinations. And uh, I'm really uh, on other avenues, uh, really trying to advocate for these special schools uh, to get vaccinated because we are right in the heart of all that. You know, but we do see even our students with all our goods suffering the most because they some of our kids don't attend. Uh, but we're able to, as a nimble school, do house visits and send our staff uh, right to the communities where they are. Uh, and we're so good at positive reinforcement and and reward and, and really trying to get kids engaged. But we are seeing high incidence of crisis calls, truancies, and uh, parents pulled in so many directions that, that schooling isn't their top priority. So, you know, in the end, all those challenges aside, therapeutic schools are providing in-person services at the emotional educational level and reducing the negative effects of COVID-19 on, on these kids who need it most. 
We're able to relieve families of having their children navigate distance learning. We're really supporting food insecurity and developing the whole child during a time of disconnect. We're primed to connect, advocate, and build relationships. And I think one of the things uh, that some colleagues wanted me to say is, you know, this intervention that's happening right now in real time really is able to stem larger costs of residential treatment, adjudication, uh, and, and all the costs uh, associated with kids uh, not getting these basic needs met and not learning these new skills. So what a privilege it is to, to be working at one of these schools. And uh, thanks for taking a little time to hear about it. The last time I presented at the educational committee, uh, most of the committee was not aware that these therapeutic schools were kind of lumped into independent schools as a whole. And so even though I'm president of Visa and an active member for independent schools, I, I also have a role in kind of distinguishing the needs of the therapeutic community uh, from, from some of the other schools. And so I, I appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Senator uh, Lyons. Uh, thank you. That you know that that's really uh, very helpful. Um, the question I have is how how the schools are um, supported. You know, where does the money come from? Basically, obviously, it's at the Baird Center, um, and so there's a significant amount of uh, public dollars that goes into the that whole area. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about the funding streams for that. I, I can speak to that pretty well. So okay. if you're a designated agency, one of those 14 schools, you're able to get Medicaid uh, in a different way from the rest of the schools. Um, so we're able to, at Kindle Farm, we're able to leverage a little bit of Medicaid. Other schools use a cert rate in almost their entire uh, funding or a large part of their funding can come from uh, the mental health side of things. For the other schools, and, and for Kindle Farm too, it's tuition to the local district. So the districts have to go to their town, uh, predict how many kids are out of, out of placement and get approved in the budget. Uh, that, that's true for Kindle Farm and a vast majority of those schools um, in their special ed town budgets. So those are the two kind of revenue streams there. Thank you. Um, how many students, I'm wondering, of those 800 students, are some of those residential students coming from out of state, maybe New Hampshire or Massachusetts, where students are being placed? Hmm. That's a good question. I, uh, I do not know the answer to that. So right now um, you have day students? Is that what you have? There? We at Kindle Farm is only day students. Uh, the vast majority of us are only day students, but I don't think all. Uh, and now that the retreat has closed, there's a lot of pressure down here uh, to expand services uh, and kind of make up for that for that loss. And what like, about uh, the Bennington School? Uh, is that uh, considered therapeutic? That's a girls' school now. It used to be a co-ed uh, residential. I, I would say maybe quasi-therapeutic. <laughs> I think Mill can speak better to, to out of state and, and the Bennington School than I can. Yeah, it used to be the Bennington School. It is, it's now called the Vermont School for Girls. Uh, it is a residential program uh, and it is a special ed program. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Uh, oh, I can also add to your question, Senator, about uh, uh, people coming in from across the state lines. There is a fair amount of that that goes on up and down the Connecticut River Valley. Um, special education students uh, coming into Vermont uh, at various points uh, in the valley. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, special ed money flowing both ways between Vermont and New Hampshire and somewhat less uh, between Vermont and Massachusetts. One quarter of our students are from uh, New Hampshire, but it's just a day program. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Hooker. So uh, Mr. Moore, is the Vermont School for Girls part of the independent school system or is it a function of the state and is the funding different from Kindle Farm? 
Um, it is an independent school. It's part of our association. Uh, some of their placements are made by DCF, girls who uh, are in the children in need of supervision, uh, found to be that way through the court system. Others are placed as special ed placements. And so they, they would be paid for by tuition from their district? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I do want to just go ask Jim, if you don't mind, Jim Demaray, I know we were talking about recognized schools not having to need background checks, but I'm thinking uh, 16 BSA 255 might actually require um, recognized but not approved independent schools do need background checks, but I'm wondering if you could just check that for me. Um, sure, yep. Uh, I'm, you can get back to us. I just want to make sure that throughout, you know, the state, uh, at least. Well, it, it does read, it does read, uh, superintendents, headmasters, uh, recognized or approved independent schools in their contracts to show request criminal record checks. So, okay, so everybody needs to cover them. Yep. Yeah. That's okay. good to hear. I, I saw everyone's face kind of blank when yeah. they thought there might be a carve out, including yeah. mine. Yeah. Okay. Well, I was mistaken on that. But that's that's okay. I've been mistaken about half a dozen times today, so uh, no problem at all. Um, any other questions? Terrific. Well, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to S sixteen, and uh, I'm thinking. Perhaps the, the best way to, uh, to do this is to first hear from, um, I know that there's a time limit with one of, our, one of our witnesses. So perhaps what we can do is have uh, our two witnesses, Drew and Mill, just talk a little bit about their thoughts on S16, the School Discipline Advisory Council, and then what we'll have is as a committee, we'll have uh, Jim go through the new draft that we worked on. Since I think um, we didn't really touch much on the independent school language in uh, the original bill. So if the two of you would, given also that you're, you have a, some time constraints, uh, if you both would like to weigh in, that would be much appreciated. Sure, I'll, I will start and I just have a brief thing and then I'll ask Drew to pick up after that. Um, we would like to have in the bill a requirement that uh, an independent school representative be named to the council. Uh, actually, two representatives, one from a general ed uh, school perspective and one from the special ed schools. Uh, independent schools are required to uh, report, as, as you know, and probably will be required under whatever measures the Agency of Education chooses to, to take uh, in compliance with this proposed bill. So we think that the independent uh, community needs to be represented here. The special ed schools have uh, additional, uh, more intense and different kinds of school dismissal issues to deal with. And so that's why I'm asking that they also be represented. And that's up to, to Drew to, to explain. Thank you. Well, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm going to advocate that a, a therapeutic school be, be one of those schools because they have, they have the experience uh, <clears throat> working with kids with trauma and knowing the effects of trauma, building relationships, they have access to the mental health resources and coordination, uh, and they are championing restorative practices and community integration. It's also really interesting to think when I read the bill, um, you know, we do occasionally sus suspend a child for a day or two uh, when they've been physically unsafe or um, in, by public school standards, um, you know, uh, pretty, pretty high level. Uh, and it's not a punishment, but to uh, have a, a team approach with the parents, the therapist, understanding what it is uh, and how to come back and, and work with the child. So uh, I just think uh, that a therapeutic school would, would offer a lot of perspective on, on their practices and uh, best practices in general. Um, so that's just a, a little point of advocacy. I'm, I'm pretty excited about the bill. I think it's great. Okay. 
any committee questions or comments for our two witnesses on S-16 or anything else that they, they've already mentioned or discussed? Okay, see no hands. I wanna thank you both very much for taking the time to come in today. It was great for overview as well as uh, testimony on S-16. And uh, please continue to watch our work and at any point that you wanna weigh in, I hope you'll uh, reach out to Jeannie or me or, or a member of the committee. Thank you so much for your time, Senators. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Thank you. Committee, why don't we uh, just take a, a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll come back at uh, 2.35. And at that point, I'll, uh, Jim will go through our new version of S16. Thank you. Everybody had a good break. S16, I just, I, uh, Jeannie was uh, kind enough to email around to everybody so that you have it fresh right in front of you. Um, uh, hoping that uh, um, Mr. Demaray will now take us through this, this new draft, knowing that we will have uh, additional changes, of course, um, but uh, hopefully this will move us in the direction of where people feel most comfortable. So with that, Jim, take it away. Okay. So, sir, sure, sure, try screen share this. Would you like that on the screen too? Uh, that's, I, I, I mean, I have it right in front of me. I, does everybody have it? Anybody need it up on the screen? No, but I do have a question on which draft. Please. Is the draft that, that Jeannie just sent out different than the draft that was posted to our committee page? Like, is that a yet another new draft? No, it's identical. It should be absolutely identical. Okay. Is that correct? Yeah. That's there, correct. Was, there was just the one change, you know, our one meeting. Um, I, I didn't make any changes. I don't think anybody else recommended any changes. So I believe they're both exactly the same. So yeah. thank you. Good question. Okay. So for the record, uh, Jim Damore, the Council, we're going through your strike all amendment to S-16. Um, the language and the findings has not changed. So I'll skip by those unless you want, want to go through findings. Okay. Um, section two on page four is where the changes begin. Um, and what this does is it incorporates Secretary French's recommendation with some of the elements from Senator Sierra's original bill. Um, I will say that, that Secretary French's recommendations are the same recommendations that were made by the Racial Equity Task Force. So to the extent that the task force recommendations are brought into a bill, they're much broader than just education, they cut across different uh, policy areas. You will be seeing similar language, or you might be seeing similar language elsewhere. Um, yeah. So um, just to clarify, so you said they are, they are this, it's the same language, the racial same language where Secretary, Secretary French presented and what the racial task force presented are the same. Thank you. What you've done is a bit different because you're combining that concept with some of some of the serious concepts. I see. So, yeah. so um, on page four, uh, line five, uh, this is now session law, not going to statute, not being codified. Um, there is created the Task Force on School Discipline Reform. Uh, the Task Force for shall, in conjunction with the Agency of Education, make recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors. If I pause there, that is from Secretary French and from the Racial Equity Task Force. And then going on from there, in collect and analyze data is coming from uh, Senator Sears' bill. So it says, and collect and analyze data relevant uh, regarding school discipline in Vermont public and approved independent schools in order to inform strategic planning, guide statewide and local decision making and resource allocation and measure the effect of statewide and local uh, policies and practices. Uh, the membership is uh, composed just, of the secretary. Uh, let's just pause there for a moment, uh, see if anybody has any questions 
at this point or concerns, anything that they want to raise? I mean, the only thing that jumps out to me is uh, make recommendations to a, a, a end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors. You know, I could see a question on the floor for a definition of what those what those behaviors are. And uh, I don't know if there's a way or uh, to, uh, you know, explain that or, or if it's important to leave it broad like that. I believe this bill goes on to require a definition of those behaviors. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, and if it doesn't, I think I'm right. If it doesn't, you can add that, so. Thank you, Jim. Um, membership of the task force uh, is the Secretary of Education, and not more than 20 members appointed by the Secretary of Education, who shall be Vermont residents and shall be educators, administrators, high school students, special educators, parents of students, school board members, and members of community groups working in areas of racial justice in school discipline reform, you should probably pause their membership before pausing, let me go through the next diversity requirement. It says the secretary shall seek in making appointments to the task force, racial diversity in membership, and shall include reps of public and approved independent schools to the point raised earlier. And that's where you could add, if you chose to, including therapeutic schools. Senator Terzi. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, if we could go back um, to page four uh, under that section two, um, and I'm still, I apologize to me because I'm still really learning, um, you know, the bill language and so on. Um, but the version I'm looking at now, which Jenny, uh, Jeannie sent out versus what we had, this would be the most up-to-date version that would be submitted for the committee to vote on and then uh, moved on to the Senate to vote on, correct? Yeah, I mean, uh, just for clarification, I'm not sure if this helps, but uh, we wouldn't be voting on this today. What I anticipate is right. more edits, more changes, and maybe if things were to work out, maybe later next week, we might get to something that we would send to the floor. So one thing that I didn't see in the first version that's in the second version uh, is under that section two, my idea or con my idea of this concept was to form a study committee for the next couple of years to look at the data and analyze it. Now, if I'm reading this correctly, under section two, it is saying um, the, task force, the task force shall in conjunction with the Agency of Education make recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but most serious student behaviors. Why is, I guess we heard that as testimony, but why would that be in the bill? And, and it's almost like we're declaring that the task force shall um, make recommendations to end suspensions. Wouldn't we want them to make that determination? I just don't understand why it's in here. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, Senator Purcell. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. I think it's it's a very logical question. And the reason like that, that I wanted to have it in there is because there have already been several task force, if you want to call them, or uh, looks at this. And they've said that these expulsions and suspensions are, are, are detrimental, basically. And that's like what the Secretary of Education, on his professional opinion, seemed to be agreeing that we do need to move to that but instead of just saying in the law, you know, you, you shall end them, we don't know where the line is because there's definitely some serious behavior where you'd want a suspension. And we're saying in general, these have not been helpful. So figure out where that line is and how do you, how do you get there from where we are now, where we use them to where we don't use them. And so it seems like we are saying, we're agreeing with the studies that have been done that they're not helpful, uh, but we're at, we want this task force to figure out how to get there instead of, because uh, I just don't think another task force to look at it is necessary at this point. It seems like all the ones that have looked at it have said it's it's not a good practice. Uh, Senator Lyons, did you want to weigh in on that? Yeah. Okay. I... Uh, yeah, no. Um, I, so do we want to say something like that? Like, uh, 
something about the previous task forces, and this one is to take the step, the next step. <laughs> uh, I believe those are in the findings already. It, it is the in the findings. So, Senator okay. Tarantini, does this help? Well, it, it helps. I just think that um, maybe I'll hold more of my thoughts for now, and we can let Jim continue on, um, and maybe we can revisit. I don't. I don't exactly know what the proper procedure is when you when you're this close to a bill. If there's a debate amongst the committee or or whatever, but I can hold my thoughts for now. Okay, if you want to hold them for now, but we can always we can always stop and pause and have have discussions. Senator Hooker, were you going to say something? Just that in our previous discussions, we talked about not wanting to wait two years for the task force to come up with recommendations. Right. And I think Senator Perchlick pointed out that, you know, there are other studies that the task force can look at to implement, you know, start implementing the process and still collect data. I think certainly that was my um, concern was that the data would continue to be collected so that we could see that there, um, what kind of an effect any of these changes had. Yeah. Okay, Jim. Okay, so oh, you asked. Him that, I do still. Have, I guess I now have a question on that because it says yeah. that they'll make recommendations to end suspensions. So who are they making recommendations to? The report. We're not there yet, but the report will come to you. So I think that's, you know, to, to Senator Terenzini's point, if if the recommendations are just recommendations and not ending the, the these, uh, you know, tools, if you want to call them that, then there's still that opportunity if you're concerned about that. Good point. Okay, let's keep, let's continue. Well, let's just talk first uh, about membership. And then I think some of this, hopefully we might at the end might make us feel a little bit better as we go forward. Maybe some of the concerns that are being raised uh, still will be concerns. But um, as it relates to membership, how do senators feel about that? The size, the makeup. I guess I look to some, Senator Terenzini. Uh, we're at the bottom of page four, Senator Campion for clarification. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, I guess I once again asked the, the question. I, I mean, we did, it looks like we really did uh, consolidate quite a bit from version one to this, if I'm correct. But um, I, I once again, I guess I just, asked, I don't know if it's a deal breaker in my eyes, but to have high school students on it, once again, I'll make the same comment I made about having parents of students that have been suspended. I, I just don't know. I mean, obviously, in my opinion, a high school student could be biased that they're not in favor of suspension and they're not. In, so I just don't know if there's value in that. And this comes from a person who was a student school board member and I appreciate the student involvement greatly, right. but in a decision of discipline, I don't know if there's, I don't know if that's the right seat for a high school student to be sitting at is all I'm saying. In this case, and Jim, uh, correct me uh, on this, but are we requiring that you know, we're saying 20 members appointed by the Secretary of Education. So yes, yeah, so it'll be Vermont residents and representation from each of these groups. Sure. Yeah. You know, up to sure. 20 members. So you would have special educators, parents of students, just general parents of students, right? Uh, high school students. Now in this draft, I haven't read beyond, but is this, students, high school students that have experienced expulsions and ex suspensions or just high school students? As drafted, it's just high school students. Just so. high school students, okay. All right. Um, Senator Lyons? So uh, two things. Um, I think uh, somehow saying something about balanced representation from the following would be helpful. Um, I like in this, to, yeah. yeah, that. And then, but the other thing is, you know, so I can understand what Senator Terenzini is saying that there might be some bias on the part of high school students, but in my experience, there are also some high school students who have actually taken over and developed a judicial process to evaluate and to put in place some disciplinary um, rules. So 
you know, if you select the right group, uh, they may have some more, uh, some creative ideas about not, not so much this kind of discipline is bad or that kind of discipline is bad, but rather a, a framework and a process to put in place within a, a school uh, that would engage the students in a different way. So just something to think about. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting point. Um, it's, uh, yeah, something to consider. Yes, Senator. Just to try to bring this to some moving forward point, I would say the language yesterday, I completely agree, Senator Terenzino, it was too narrow with the type of high school student that had an incident. I, I like this because it really empowers the board, the Secretary of Education to, to find the right high schoolers that will help contribute and get us to the, the, the actual objective where we are. So I think it's vague enough that it'll be a, a well-suited high school student um, and not necessarily that narrow pigeonholed specific student with an experience that was in the yesterday version. You know, for new senators and even returning, I, I, I can't answer this question. How will the Secretary of Education go about finding high school students, Jim, usually? I mean, on other committees, for example, we, for natural resources, and I'm sure health and welfare, uh, Senator Lyons might be able to help us with this. You know, I, how do they usually, you know, they're usually quite specific, some of the studies for natural resource and energy, but this is pretty broad. Um, how does the Secretary, and maybe this is a question for the Secretary, I think it is. I mean, the secretary meets with the uh, so-called B. You saw the all the advocacy groups every week, and I okay. would imagine he'd tap into them and say, "Can you give me some recommendations?" But that's a up to him to answer. Yeah. No, I was just just curious about that a little bit. Senator Lyons, did we're going to weigh in. No. Okay. 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 Go ahead. Oh, so we're going to go on to page five, line six about powers and duties. So again, it says task force shall make recommendations to end suspensions and expulsions for all but the most serious student behaviors and shall perform the following tasks. The first four tasks are from Secretary French and the Racial Equity Task Force. The remaining tasks on the next page are from Senator Sears' bill. The first four uh, review in-school services and availability of these services in various SUs, approved independent schools and regions of the state that are available to support students who would otherwise face exclusionary discipline. Two, recommend additional or more uniform in-school services that should be available to students who would otherwise face exclusionary discipline. Three, define, define the most serious behaviors that after considering all other alternatives and supports should remain eligible for suspension or expulsion. Four, identify best practice procedures that minimize law enforcement contacts for students facing in-school or exclusionary discipline. Next page five goes on to, uh, page six, but number five goes on to uh, Senator Sears uh, points. Uh, which is about data. Five says analyze current data collection definitions and practices used in Vermont for misconduct and for disciplinary actions that result in a student's exclusion in the classroom and develop standard definitions and practices as necessary for the collection of all appropriate de data uh, related, related to school discipline. And then six, analyze on, on a school district and approved independent school basis the available data regarding suspensions and expulsions and identify, collect, and analyze additional data necessary to inform the work of the task force, including um, A, total number of instances of expulsions and suspensions in each grade operated by the district or approved in the school. B, the total number of students in each grade operated by the district or approved in the school who were expelled or suspended and the number of instances of expulsion or suspension or both for each student. C, the duration of each instance of expulsion and suspension. D, the infraction. Um, uh, uh, and E, each 
instance of referral to local law enforcement authorities. And seven, share insights and best practices with Vermont educators, school administrators, uh, policymakers, agencies, and education advocacy organizations. Can I pause there before we go on? Any questions, comments, Senator Persper? Yeah, number seven seems a little just worded differently than other statute that I'm familiar with, where it just says, you know, share insights and best practices with all these different people. And maybe we're okay with it being that that broad. I don't have a specific suggestion right now, but it just strikes me as as very a very broad kind of general charge. And maybe we're okay with that, but uh, I just want to flag it and think yeah. about it a little more. I mean, what I like about it and it might just be the language that we need to change. Um, of course, I'm open to even, of course, removing it. But, I, I, you know, anytime we can share information and, and you know, research and ideas with different groups. Um, I, you know, I like when we, we as a state do those kinds of things, but. Uh, Definitely. And, but, you know, usually you have it like as part of a report or like just sharing insights. Uh, you, I see what you mean. You know, what, how, they, how are they, they going to share, yeah, you know. A, that's a great point. Yeah. So it, instead of it is so broad that, um, you know, do we want to make that as part of the report that the report shall have these insights and best practices and then that the whole report is shared with these folks or something like that. But I'm, yeah, I think, Jim, if you wouldn't mind kind of getting some language that would get us a, a little more uh, specific, a little more greater specificity, greater direction um, would be helpful there. Yeah, sure. I, I think uh, yeah. one option is to, is to have the ADC post the report on its website and maintain it so people can see it. And, um, yeah. Well, I was just going to say if Jim thought that number seven would be kind of automatically a part of the report, or is number seven different than the report? Um, well, the report requirements next, actually, it's it's on page seven, um, and it's to bring a report to you with its findings and re recommendations. Um, so we can put in the report requirement more detail as to what the report has to specify, uh, and then you can also make AOE post it on its website so it's available to everybody. I mean, the posting thing, I mean, I think it's fine. I just don't know how uh, how people get there, you know? In, in other words, what would prompt somebody to, to check the website? Um, it's like so much research is out there. I, as I said yesterday, I think in terms of education, how do you get people to the, to the site? But Senator Chinden? I'm going to always reflect on experiences like my city council role. And I would say in, in this yeah. case, I, I'd go with uh, de deference to the agency of education. And, and, and I like the language in that encouraging the sharing of this information and somewhat leave it to them to communicate it in the right channel. So I think the language charges the sharing and then hopefully the secretary would then integrate it into whatever communication modes would make the most sense for his expertise and understanding how the agency functions. But I really like also what Senator Chitton just his final comments, you know, uh, where he said, allow the direct the agency of education to share it in the way that they, I don't exactly, you know, uh, find it to be the most efficient, most broad, you know, something like that. Senator Perchlick? And well, it's the task force that's doing the sharing. So, you know, that's not necessarily the secretary. Well, we I mean, could think it would be the secretary. I just didn't know, you know, I'm willing to think about it some more and think about what the right language is, but, you know, I, I agree with what Senator Chin has said. We want to give them that leeway, the best of their uh, professional opinion. But right now it's, this is the task of the task force, which, you know, the secretary isn't a member of and the task force isn't even reporting to the secretary. So we should just make sure we have them doing what we want them to do. Based on your discussion, it sounds like we should, we should take out seven as a task force requirement and put it under um, the next section on the reporting and make it be a requirement of the agency 
to share. I think that's a great uh, step. Yeah. What do you think, Senator Persley? Yeah, no, that that sounds that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. We just want to make sure that the I guess we want to have the task force identify what these are, and then that it's part included in the report, which I guess maybe goes without saying that if it's in the report they've identified it and that the report shall be shared with these entities. But we leave it up to them how to share the report to Senator Chittenden's point. Yeah, yeah. AOEs obviously will be there for ever and uh, this task force goes away in a year or so, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. okay. So uh, my sub, uh, my lettering got off here. Uh, the next section report should be E and F, so I'll have to fix that. But um, the report is due to you on a report November 30th of this year. Now, I can expand that section as we talked about. Uh, meetings are standard. So the first meeting will be uh, August 1st this year. Um, the task force will not meet more than six times. Uh, we have the assistance of the Agency of Education, and they would be reimbursed with their standard per diem and uh, reimbursement of expenses. So Appropriations blank. And just, uh, for new senators, so just say uh, something about the per diem. Is that for, and for a reminder for all of us, uh, that's for each member? Yeah, each member who's not otherwise compensated gets a per diem. I believe it's 50 bucks a day. A day. And then reimbursement based on mileage and- Right. So if, for example, a legislator were on it, would a legislator get, re get the per diem? Yes. Uh, they, they would um, if the legislature are serving on a task force or committee outside of the session, the normal session, they get reimbursement. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Persley. Yeah. Uh, Jim, on the recommendation for legislative action, and, and e, what F should that should be e in line six, is yep. that, is it your understanding that? we would need legislative action to not have suspensions and expulsions be happening? Is, does that need to be legislative or could the Agency of Education or the Board of Education do that without legislation? You would need to uh, revise current statute for that. Uh, in, in current statute, those requirements are on this and they'd be different, I think, if you went this direction. Okay, um, section three is the appropriation. We don't know how much it's for. We know it's gonna cover per diem and reimbursement, but there are other expenses that CASA may have in collecting data, for example. So we have to hear from the agency as to what that number might be. Okay. So I left that blank. Um, page eight, section four is about data collection. Um, this is on before the first meeting of the task force. The secretary shall collect and distribute to members all readily available data on suspensions and expulsions from each Vermont public school and approved independent school in academic years uh, 2013 through 2019, including the, the data specified in subdivision D6 of section two. So D6 on the previous page, you go back to page six, line six, has a lot of detail as to um, the data that the, the council, the task force needs to analyze, and that's the, the data that the, the um, secretary has to produce for them. Um, Jim, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, for new senators, uh, all, can all the education statutes be, be found online in case people ever want to cross-reference, or should I get uh, education? So if you go to the General Assembly website, Yep. There is uh, a tab uh, for um, kind of exist existing laws, Vermont laws. If you tap on that, uh, you'll find a link to all the statutes. So 1 through 32, the titles 1 through 32 are there online. And the statute you want, the title you want to go to is 16. 16 has all the education statutes in it. 
What I love is every time I have a question, I say it's for new senators, but really it's partly for me. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. So um, we're on page eight again. We're on line 11, uh, subsection B. Yeah. So this says that on before July, 20, July 1, 2022, the Secretary of Education and the State Board shall incorporate the task force standard definitions and practices developed in subdivision B5 into their data collection rules, procedures, the, the extent permitted by privacy laws. And so require the collection of data as recommended by the task force beginning with the 23-24 school year. So D5, uh, we're talking about there, um, going back to page six on line one, task force is supposed to analyze current data collection definitions and practices used for misconduct and um, develop standard definitions and practices. I see an app for that. Sorry. Uh, and so develop standard definitions and pra practices as necessary for collection. So it's cross frame back to the definitions that the task force comes up to, but it's saying in section four on page eight is, is that those definitions uh, shall be basically put into rules. Move forward. Section five is outcome analysis. So it says that on before June 15 of each year from 2025 to 2030, Secretary of Education should submit a written report to you on suspensions and expulsions from each Vermont public school and approved independent school in the prior school year, including the data specified in, again, subdivision D6, so all that uh, data. So you have a sense for outcome from what you've done. And the effective date is, um, on passage, and then the title of the bill would change upon passage to an act relating to the creation of the task force on school discipline reform. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any immediate questions or comments that anyone wants to make? Otherwise, what I thought we could do is uh, give everyone uh, I put it on the calendar for Tuesday to, uh, after everybody reviews it over the weekend, see if we have additional questions. I was going to, I'm going to ask the Agency of Education to come in and weigh in on things. Uh, and I also want anybody over the weekend to think about any other witnesses they would like to hear from as we move forward. But uh, this is, um, yes, yeah, Senator Lyons. Um, I might have, I might have missed it. Um, is there anything in here that asks the task force to look for model programs in other states? No, there isn't. No. I wonder if that is I like that. Anybody oh. disagree with that? Looking for model programs in, in other states? You disagree, Senator Chen? No, no, I just want to say I'm a big fan of benchmarking. <laughs> I do it a lot at UVM. It's always the first place to start. So great point, Senator Lyons. Yeah, and it, you know, it could be NCSL or somebody's got mm -hmm. something. Yeah. And this really is for new senators. If you haven't had an opportunity to reach out and look at the NCSL or CSG websites, they are great resources and, and great spots to completely um, nonpartisan you know, get involved as much as you can, go to their conferences, be a part of them, either related to education issues or anything that, you know, you're, you're passionate about. Um, and if you ever need any help reaching out or, or uh, please let, let, let us all know. So does everyone feel okay with uh, spending some time over the weekend uh, looking at this? I remember back to house education when our first bills would sort of come through I would just personally just need some time to digest it, uh, talk talk things through, take a look, see what if any had any questions, any other witnesses that you want to hear from, and then we can kind of gather again. We'll make time on Tuesday, Jeannie, if you wouldn't mind scheduling the Agency of Education Secretary French to come in and weigh in on this new draft. That would be helpful. Would you like me to update this draft with a 
comments you've had so far? That would be helpful actually. And then if you wouldn't mind, I don't know what your schedule looks like, Jim, but if you would email us a, a new draft sometime over the weekend, that would give us- Yeah, I'll do it today. So you're that, would happy. Be, yeah. that would be great. And Jeannie, um, did you, uh, are you okay uh, getting the Agency of Education in on Tuesday to, to review this? Uh, yeah, can we talk after the- Absolutely, I just wanted to make sure, yep, great. Great, okay, thank you all. It, uh, we're getting there.